So thank you again. Uh, thank you again, wonderful panelists. What we're going to do is we're just going to kind of start uh, up here uh, with a couple of key questions that, and that anyone can actually respond to. There's a couple of directed questions from Twitter. Then I'm going to open it up uh, to our folks who, who decided to come and spend time with us in person. Okay? So I do want to start with this notion of nice people. Um, and uh, for, for any of you to you just kind of speak to, how have you seen nice people impact um, our ability to, again, um, challenge, move forward, do the work through the social justice and decolonization and racial justice lens? Um, and what, what, what are any, any thoughts and or recommendations that you have for us as we, uh, whether that's from a who we're preparing space or administrator space. So again, my, our senior leaders who are working with cabinets um, where we're often seen as the, the voice that needs to do that challenge. So a couple of voices in around that, yes. One of the things I want to focus on is um, nice people aren't racist, right? <laughs> mm. And so our inability to name the racism that's embedded in our systems processes ourselves is such a barrier to our moving forward in these ways. And if we can't just recognize we're all part of a culture that's imbued with racism, we have to systematically dismantle it through really hard work, almost the kind of work you do in therapy, right? Mm, that's good, and, that's good. Mm -hmm. and really recognizing mm -hmm. that. But, but because r racism, being tagged with the label of racism, has become sort of a... Um, one of the ways in which we marginalize people as well, right, or, you know, create them as the other, the not, not me, not the nice person, the other people, that has really systematically harmed us. And I'm saying that for all of American society, right? You know, the whole I'm not racist, but, and then, you know, the next thing that comes out of the mouth. Um, so I just think that's really challenging. And so doing that um, you know, you can, you, you can do that way more easily with students who are still open to learning and haven't necessarily gotten all of that socialization around, I can't be racist, I can't be racist, I can't be racist, or I'll, you know, lose my job, fall into the floor, whatever it is. So I think that's a real challenge, and um, I think it's trying to unembed that and recognize the systems of how we got there is just super important for our work. Roger. I think that's very similar to what I was going to say as well, and, and that is that, you know, the, the, those nice people would identify as non-racists, and our, our perpetuation of this notion of non-racism uh, instead of anti-racism, an active form of combating the racist structures and systems that surround us every single day. You know, the, the, the sort of typical approach to this work through diversity and inclusion efforts in institutions of higher education, in, in the absence of systematic anti-racism efforts, um, actually sometimes operate to marginalize people, uh, the very people that they are thinking that they are trying to help. We bring people into our institutions ill-equipped to help them navigate those institutions or to have institutions that are welcoming and inclusive in ways that really do help uh, foster a sense of ownership rather than you know, simply a sense of welcoming. Um, a sense of belonging you know, is good, but ownership is even better. Uh, and the idea has to be that I have a, 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 a sense of myself as part of the very structure and operation and governance of an institution. That I'm not just here to help educate the privileged who already exist in these institutions. And many of our students actually do feel that way. And a lot of nice people have great intentions to allow people to gain access, to allow people to gain entry, but then it stops there. And so, you know, we have to get beyond nicism, nice, niceness and non-racism and really combat those systematic sy structures that create those barriers. 
Appreciating so much about what you just kind of raised there again as we talk about the systems and the things that are in place and how people are often uh, in the space where they want to intentionally or, or want to uh, allow themselves to be in just kind of the non-space, right? That um, the work then becomes how do we, uh, as those who are preparing and working with um, those who, people who will serve, how do we create environments and cultures where folks can do, again, as Penny named, just own it, right? Just own and accept that um, we are all products of our backgrounds, our systems, that, that racism is embedded, that sexism, that heteronormativity, that um, the classes that, you know, again, as we look at who these institutions were set up for, um, that we are part of that, that, and, um, that we did not create it, but we have to deal with it. So. What do you, what do you think? I was going to say, Jamie, you, you hit on the point that I wanted to build upon that Julie said that, that students come with this lived experience and then now we're telling them to own their own sense of development in the student personnel point of view. It's the same thing with administrators and faculty. We don't, sometimes we don't know what we don't know, but our own experience. And so how do you create, not just safe, but I call it brave, you know, you've heard of safe, brave, many different titles, but are spaces where people can be vulnerable about what they don't know and not be, 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 be challenged, but then also places where behavior and attitudes can be challenged as well. And so um, that, that takes work because so an individual has to see value and then coming forth and sharing. And then institutions have to create spaces where these dialogues can take place uh, on, a, on, a, on a faculty student place. And so we've taken the University of Michigan's intergroup relations program, which a lot of us are familiar with. And over the last couple of years, we've, we've not had it the last year, but we're gonna we restart it in terms of this perspective. We created three tiers, undergraduate tier, graduate level tier, faculty and administrator tier. And so by doing those tiers, it has created spaces for faculty and administrators to sit in the same processes like intergroup relations and have conversations, which has also created new allies but also cause people to have processes about things that they experience, which I would say all of us have generational things. They, don't, they didn't realize like my, my, my brother did not get into dentistry school. I assumed it was affirmative action. So they're walking around with this on them, and, but they never had a chance to express it or, or for that to be challenged. And so how do you create people a chance to process their life and understand, okay, as I process my life, it's gonna hopefully help me include others and also in, inform my thinking. So those are just some thoughts in terms of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll just add in terms of the doing, um, I think it, it is is easier said than done. Mm. Meaning that as a faculty member, I do try to do these things in a classroom and set my course up so that the readings and the materials and the things we use, it doesn't really leave you anything except the option to put it out there. But as the person trying to create the spaces we're talking about, like there are consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 in speaking with numerous faculty of color, it is typically us, <laughs> um, you know, don't, you know, putting that labor forward. And it has a physical impact. You know what I'm saying? Like chocolate chip cookies are all of a sudden better after I've taught a class on racism, <laughs> right? So I'm just saying that there there are physical consequences um, and even beyond, you know, the classroom, um, there's one project I'm doing um, at IUPUI, the White Racial Literacy Project. It's designed to provide white people a space with other trained white people to talk about whatever it is, whatever it means to be white, to ask the questions you think are dumb, to not be perceived as racist. And even that's, you know, pushback from nice white people who, you know, don't want, who are resistant to this notion that they're somehow illiterate, right? Even with a white person saying it. But I think the value in that is that sometimes I can say something and my white colleague can say something, but somehow it just lands better. And so one of the things that I've tried to do is encourage white people. Well, you already know, get your people. You know, I just want, them to you know be more involved in it so that this labor isn't always placed on you know the backs and bodies of people of color to get white people to see 
And it's not that white people are the only people who need to see, but I think in terms of shifting systems and policies, there's a lot of power embedded in whiteness. And so the, the resistance is palatable for people of color trying to do the work. Absolutely. I've got a question um, for Julie uh, that says, what new questions do we need to be asking? And what new people do we need to bring to the table to inform our research and our practice? <sighs> we'll start there and then yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll just think, I mean, to think about new questions within some of the things that I study, right? And so, for instance, um, you know, for a long time, I've had a body of research that looks at cross-racial interaction, right? And so we talk about the educational benefits of diversity and how students come to the university and are able to, um, yeah, have these richer experiences because they're able to engage with and interact with each other. And that's a very rosy narrative, and there is data that supports that. But then at the same time, um, that for in order for that process to work the way it's supposed to, there's a presumption that students share some level of equal status. And that's usually, you know, in the theory, that's usually kind of thrown at, out as an assumption that's been met. But I think the lived reality is we know that students aren't equal. And so what does it mean to bring, how could we complicate the study, say, of cross-racial interaction and some of these other processes to say, well, if things aren't equal, <laughs> right, what is happening? Or do we have some solutions for why things aren't working, right, in the rosy way that we always want them to work? So in my own work, that would just be some a line of question that I've often thought about, but I'm not quite sure how to study. Yeah. 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 What I appreciate so much about, again, what you raise is that often we're talking about creating greater inclusion and, um, uh, and equity and justice without owning inequity mm -hmm. and injustice. Mm -hmm. Right. And so um, so what you just highlighted for me, as you named that is, well, yeah, let's just bring them together and have cross racial interaction and. Uh, but we're not owning the history um, and the experiences of injustice and, and how, who, who am I in the conversation with you mm -hmm. um, that uh, allows me to show up as me in full voice or not. Yeah, thank you. I see some, some, some hands down there uh, trying to get in. Thank you. I, I have, I think, a couple of responses to the question. One, one would be, you know, I, uh, during the early part of my career as a psychologist, I did a lot of research on multicultural counseling competencies. And I think there's a parallel in the student affairs literature around c competencies for doing this work. And I think we need um, more effective, uh, more comprehensive work in that area, right? We talk a lot about what those competencies might be um, and do we have good measures of them, right? Other than people saying, well, I, I've, I've studied it or I think I'm you know, reasonably good myself or you know, do we have objective you know, evidence that people are doing this work competently? And then what are the impact? You know, what, what, what is the impact of competent work in the actual experience of students. And that brings me to the second part, which is, you know, I've done some work around uh, campus climate research. And, and campus climate research is this very complex uh, set of issues that, you know, a lot of people try to quantify it in ways that are overly uh, scientific or um, caught up in scientific kind of mumbo jumbo. Um, when in reality, campus climate research is uh, an inductive approach to research that that is about a campus. About uh, it's a it's a case study of a campus. It's a conceptualization using oftentimes surveys, which yields a lot of valuable data, but not treated in the same way that our other sort of scientific, publishable, quantitative approaches to research might be. So we don't need random samples, we need diverse samples in our climate research, right? Um, we don't, you know, uh, we don't need to have, you know, these testable hypotheses. We need to use that data to help inform us about what the lived experiences are of people on our campuses, whether they're students or faculty or staff of various different groups, those kinds of things. 
I want to um, do this next question that, that came in, um, and um, this came from uh, Dr. Clinton Michael Rennell, and I'm going to ask if Chris would, would start, start with this. It's the value of audacity, um, uh, the value of the audacity of demand. Our students are saying their voices will not be silenced and they will be heard. How do we support a changing culture, um, and how do we support their ability to um, uh, operate and instill uh, a sense of agency. So I'll speak from the research perspective. As a, you know, my research, been, uh, I've been more focused on research than in the practice, which is a lack that I also have as, as a researcher, right? I haven't um, been a practitioner for the past four year, five years. Um, so I think uh, it, it, I think I'll start internally first. Uh, I think we have to understand me, myself, and I, who am I? What are my, what's my privilege, my oppression, uh, before I can work with people? Or, I mean, I can work with people, but under, helping other people process this. The other thing when I think about change is when we think, have these conversations, are hard conversations, right? It's both a process and a goal. But when we have these conversations, um, we also have to acknowledge, and, and maybe this is my educator side, that I came to education without, and in the master's program, I have never heard the term uh, social justice until I was in the master's program at Iowa State. Uh, so I, I, I put myself in the situation, there's often times that our students or even our colleagues do not know this terminology that we used. So we have to also educate others, because I used to be down here, and people, my, 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 um, my faculty brought me up here with them, right? So I think my job as, a, as an educator is to bring the people around me, but also I have to understand there's sometimes I don't want to engage in these conversations, because uh, 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 it's just sometimes it's tiring as well, so we make that decision, right? Uh, but also I think in the, in the research perspective now is when we think about change, uh, and, and I, there's a lot of thoughts that I have right now with my research on the term Latinx. We as scholars continue to, um, uh, in, in, to use the term Latinx in, in student affairs, and I just finished interviewing uh, 32 uh, people during uh, winter break, students that self-identified as Latino, Latina, or Latinx, and all of them said, um, I am Latino, Latina, but two said I'm Latina, Latinx, um, uh, and everyone else is Latinx, but I am Latino or Latina. So again, that carries a lot of privilege, but this participant said it's privilege because I already have a term for me that I could identify with my gender. So I don't want to use this term for me because it wasn't developed or created for me. But also some of these people say, well, when we think about the term Latinx, um, it is a very privileged term because I learn, I, I learn and I read queer theory, feminist theory, in the classroom while my family doesn't have access to this, while they still struggle in between Hispanic versus Latino, right? But even then it becomes a very political, emotional, and all these things, and identity. But again, it goes back to the research, the label that, the, how we label people is very problematic, right? So I think for me it's more like, let's learn from, the, from each other and appreciate that. But I also think I use the other example, we oftentimes we use the pronouns. Right, so he, him, his, but I still get tokenized, oh not tokenized, I still get called Latinx. So if we understand the definition of Latinx, how it's being used, sometimes it's being misused. And we are seeing that in a lot of research when uh, um, scholars are saying, well, I interviewed all Latino males. And then they use the term Latinx throughout that. And nothing wrong with, uh, with using the term Latinx also, right? Because it bring, there's different things that we have to acknowledge, but also we have to acknowledge that it has history. And also we have to start thinking about where we're going forward with, with, with um, that terminology that we're using in research, but also in practice, because it makes a big impact on students' development. So um, I'm, I'm gonna ask if Penny if you wouldn't mind jumping in. Uh, as, as one who, uh, again, is a, who has served in senior student affairs roles for, for, for a long time, the, this notion of agency um, and navigating the audacity of demand, right? Um, so as senior student affairs, um, administrators, the, the life that we live and what we have to uh, carry and navigate is we're talking about wanting students to have agency, holding that alongside of um, uh, this notion of audacity of demand and what that looks like, yeah. I call them requests. Um, no, one of the reasons I talk as often as I do about activism is I'm reminding myself how important it is, right? Because it makes my personal life more difficult 
right? It does. It just does. That's my job to manage those kinds of things and particularly to manage other, if it's just me and the students, we're good, but I've got to manage trustees and I've got to manage newspaper reporters and I've got to manage lots of different lenses on those situations, right? But in my mental model, uh, I, I would say 98 times out of 100 in my career, I have wanted exactly the same things the students have wanted, right? Very rarely are they demanding something that I think is bad for us or in any way, right? So, and if, if, if not, on those a couple of other occasions where um, they, they perhaps don't really understand the larger context, you know, it's, it's our job to, to educate around that, right? So I'm now, I'm really blessed to work on a pretty small campus, and so it's very easy for us to just invite the students into the room and, or, you know, to go into their rooms and just sit and listen, and we, we you know, we try to do a lot of that. Um, but, but usually we're pretty much in alignment. It's just we're really more realistic about what it takes to get there. Yeah. I, w I remember the students who demanded no tuition, free tuition for everyone. And I was like, oh gosh, that would be awesome. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really would be. Um, you know, so just trying to navigate that. But, but the sense of agency, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm literally, this is, this is a long-standing commitment of me for students to learn within the college environment skills that they're going to take out in, into pr practice. It, I used to frame that around leadership. When I worked in the Office of Campus Activities, I was really framing it around leadership, and that was really about people's accomplishing their personal goals. When I started really working in the civic engagement space is when I started really linking what we see as community service that is out there taking higher education into the world to, to improve society and bit linking that back to activism, right? So that's my own journey as I've gotten, you know, broader responsibilities um, through the process. But that, that, that agency that, you know, some people don't like the word empowerment. I like the word empowerment. I want people to feel personally powerful, right? And I mean, it's not... I can't sprinkle that on like magic dust, but, but how does one learn those concrete set of skills that makes them know, I can do this. I can go, I remember after the, um, the uh, Betsy DeVos was um, put in the Department of Education, or was being proposed for the Department of Education, I was up here for another thing, and I walked into my senator's office and I demanded to sit down with one of their constituent affairs people and just talk chapter and verse about how that, that was going to, well, you see how effective that was. But, <laughs> you know, it, I never would have done that without that own journey of myself of, of just understanding, you know, how those things link and grow. And so, um, yeah, a sense of agency, a sense of practi pra practicing in this environment. We all know what our students are going to face when they leave. They're going to face a less supportive world, even if they don't feel supported in our spaces, right? They're going out to something that's not better in terms of that, that level of personal support. So um, I don't want that to be, I want students to go armed with every tool they can possibly have to navigate that. And agency is just a huge piece of that in my mind. Absolutely. We want to open up to questions from, from the audience, um, and uh, we'll take some of those at this point. So if you've got a question, just kind of raise your hand. Uh, you get to name it, and, uh, and I'll repeat it So for our live streaming folks, and uh, we'll keep going. So questions out there. Questions out there. Yes, please. Bridget. <laughs> Thank you. I'll start with a quick one. Um, in the post-Ferguson post 
<clears throat> era, we um, had significant unrest on our campus, as many campuses did. And we, um, we had a set of demands. We had multiple sets of demands, i.e. requests uh, made of us. And one, one of my brilliant colleagues, Marian Majuka, created, I talked about the deliberative dialogue program, talked about an issue guide, uh, developed an issue guide for diversity on campus. And we had hundreds of students and others come out to hear a framing of that and then go into those small groups. And in all of those, I don't know, Cassandra, what, there were 30, maybe 30 groups. Um, um, they came forward with concrete suggestions, and all of that information got pulled together. And then there was a process of people sort of sitting in rooms, looking at all those different approaches and figuring out how they could be, what you know, which were realistic and which could be achieved and what would it take and putting budgets with them and whatnot. And so it was a really inclusive process, and um, it, it has, it's changed our campus. It's not, you know, it's not perfect in any way. We still have all the struggles, but we, we now ha also have the muscle memory of having done that, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the next wave of, of serious um, activism, we will meet with that, that kind of really inclusive process. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, we have, I think the first thing, I think let's give you a proactive and a reactive one. So, um, our JMU has been fortunate. We've only, we're on our sixth president over 100 years. And so we don't have a lot to turn over. You look, go across our administrative level, lots of people spend lots of time together. So that provides some continuity. And it also provides some relationship building where the folks I'm working with I've known for years. I'm not on, I just met me year one and what's art advocating for, we've had time to grow together. Um, but with that being said, um, our institution found itself very successful. We had about, you know, our University of Maryland, you're a lot more diverse than we, we will be at this time. Uh, we, sit, we, had, we sat one time about 9% of our student body was African American. And we watched that decline significantly. And it was a reactive position where we actually had a president now sitting who saw it at its height and like, what happened? But because of that, it opened the door for the JMU to take some hard looks at ourselves with faculty, staff, students, culture. The, the whole gamut then was reviewed, not just student admissions. And so that allowed us to create some things that now we're seeing the fruit of. And so one thing that was a reactive thing when, when the admissions numbers changed and now they're back up, we're almost, for us, we're excited. We're about 25% non-white, but we were never that high in the past. But we created a program that works with first generation and um, low socioeconomic students. We never had an intentional effort. I Meaning if you came, great, we'd support you just like everybody else, but now an intentional effort. And that has been transformative for our campus because we're pretty much an affluent university, like some other schools. Um, and because of our location, we don't draw many from a, a local urban area who live in, with family and then come to our campus. Our campus is, uh, you, you, you come to the campus university. So what that has done is opened the door for us to better understand and navigate now 15 years after creating that program about serving those populations. And so now we see initiatives that, and so that's what I want to tell people, yeah, it takes time to steer the ship. If, if we would have asked these, some of these conversations that happened 15 years ago, wouldn't have happened. But now we have people coming to the table. Oh, I was first generation. I want to help with this. How can I partner? And so the culture around that identity group has shifted. And so we've also used a model perspective in terms of how do you build room for other identity groups. Um, our first center that was non-white would have been our, our Office of Minority Affairs. That tells you when, how old it was, when it was created, right? And when we created that, now we use that model. So what, what, now our, our um, it was recently, recently renamed SOGI, and I'm drawing a name, a name, it was Allied in Education, which provided support for our LGBTQ uh, A plus community. And so we're using the same models. Okay, the first student arrived and was and we knew about was here. It took the university this long. How do we begin to create conversations in place and move and work with these vice presidents to recognize the value of serving each population? And our ability disability group, they like to be called disability group. They like to say, don't do anything for us without us. That's their term, which is, which is key. And so, so with that, is ha what has happened, I'm trying to say, is we've now opened ourselves up that didn't, I've been at this campus 26 years. That was not happening when I first arrived, that identity groups could express themselves and get the attention, and we'd have conversations about what is needed for their success on campus. And so, so, it, so, so I would say 
a, a crisis might be something that might provide an opportunity for transformation. But now we're, now we're at the stage of, okay, what proactively can we do? But, it's, but it took a crisis for us to begin to move. And so, so with that being said, if you, if you, I'll be glad to share privately some other things, but those are just some things that, and, and, and then our presidents have been providing initiatives, both top down and also bubbling up from the bottom up. What can we do? What can we do better? So faculty and students get to share in, and then also what are national best practices that we can implement. So there's been a, a synergy these last 15 years about diversity and inclusion in our institution. Right. Mm -hmm. In the spirit of success, did I see another hand go up? Okay, well, we'll grab that, that in a second. But in, in the spirit of kind of the best practices, there's a question that says, how do my, how my student affairs professionals enlist, uh, this has come from um, Kristen Wren, um, uh, incoming president uh, for ASH, uh, I think that's the right Christian, right? <laughs> 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 Forgive me if I'm not the right Chris. Um, how might uh, st uh, student affairs professionals enlist um, slash lead, again, um, others on campus in anti-racist work while doing their own work? Right. So thoughts about how we might enlist uh, and bring others along at the same time. Uh, and what I'm reading into this question, and Chris, forgive me from. Uh, misquoting, but um, while not showing up as if we're done, mm. right? So yeah. how we That's might good. bring others along while not while continuing to do our own work. Any thoughts on that? Um, well, I think I think you know there are keys, uh, you know, campus wide that we all have to do this work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there have been multiple times today in uh, the presentations of the panelists where we have talked about the idea that, that collaborating with each other across yeah. student affairs yeah. and across uh, CDOs and across other divisions of our institutions is absolutely critical. Um, faculty have to be involved in the work of student affairs. Um, we have to change the curriculum along with the co-curriculum in ways that are really, truly meaningful and transformative. You know, when we talk about, you know, removing some of that, you know, racism from the history of our uh, curriculum and, and courses, that is, you know, something that you have to partner with the faculty to do. And to change policies at institutions, faculty absolutely have to be our partners in doing this work. Um, we can't get those policy changes made to fundamentally transform our institutions without doing those kinds of Can partnership I efforts. Something to that. I think one of the things for me is as a, a Latino uh, faculty, uh, while we, the faculty, played a significant role in this, but oftentimes they only come to me. Right, because I'm the only, uh, well, my institution, I'm not the only diverse one, right? Either we have other, uh, we're very diverse, so it's really good. But I think we have to be reminded that there's other faculty that uh, can engage in this conversation. So we always uh, utilize faculty, or I mean, even our students, right? But we tokenize them and we uh, use them at the expense of their own experiences uh, to help us move forward. But I think we also have to be thoughtful that there's also, uh, privileged faculty uh, uh, or administrators in this case uh, or student affairs practitioners that, that can be part of this conversation right so it, it's it's a relationship but it seems to be like it always falls under that faculty of color in this in oftentimes in this in the in the situation as I look as I, as I, as I listen to my colleagues uh, from various institutions and mostly women of color uh, they express their experiences, and I even see it now how male privilege plays a significant role that sometimes even uh, as a Latino gay male with an accent, I have to repeat what my white co female colleague is saying because women are oftentimes dismissed in those conversations, right? So that's what, something that I'm very thoughtful of, of how my privilege plays a role, but also how I am tokenized. So when I think about a question, I'll to we'll give another, uh, the, to, uh, I don't know, a different perspective, but it's also for me is understanding where the power is and who is going to be my ally. Uh, but also because with that power, if I, I understand, if I know the person that has the power, I slowly can make change. But also like Laura Rendon said in one of her articles, uh, the, academy, ac the academy is going to change slowly, but as we slowly change too. Uh, through this process, it's painful and there's a lot of fear and it hurts, but as we slowly are changed by the academy, we're slowly changing the academy too. Yeah. There's a question back here.
So the, the question was around, again, acknowledging that um, while the CDO position is one of the fastest growing and most in, uh, growing positions in a higher education today, that getting a seat at that table has been one of the important things that have happened. What is happening, what is also happening, is the defunding um, of multicultural affairs offices and positions. And it's, no, it's everybody's work and everybody should be doing it. And so what is the, what are some thoughts around how, uh, how we might enter that conversation um, in, in the places where that's in contact? And I'm gonna invite in, I appreciate the, uh, um, the Julie talked a little bit about the importance of uh, research uh, in that. And so just want to think about that for a moment, but uh, Lori wants to so start, start. That was saying. actually the direction I was going yep, in. Yep, 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 um, yep. One of the things that's, that's interesting uh, in a study that I'm doing right now, we looked across, I think maybe 20, 2,503 articles and only 45 of them actually focused on a specific initiative. So focused on a culture center or the role of a diversity officer or uh, a STEM program to increase underrepresented. So honestly, the research isn't out there, or at least if you're looking for it, don't look in the higher ed journals. Um, I, I mean, I think you, yeah, yeah, there was, yeah, of the 45, yeah, I think it's, but, I, but if, you know, if you go to, for example, maybe Journal of Negroid, you might find more articles about uh, black studies, for example, but in general, higher education scholars really haven't taken up the work in looking at specific initiatives. There's work about the, the importance of diversity and the importance of inclusion, but when a provost or someone is trying to make decisions about about, you know, do we keep this, um, you know, how significant it, is it to the campus or is this something that we need to implement? The literature is scant. It is, it is embarrassing. And the thing is, campuses keep doing it. Or, you know, there's conversation about it, but the research really isn't there to answer specific questions about whether particular initiatives work or, you know, if one does work, you know, will other campuses, you know, adapt it or is it scalable? Like none of that really, it's just not there. And so when I read articles about uh, offices being defunded, the evidence isn't there. But I think the other piece of that is when I'm consulting with directors or you know doing uh, external reviews, you know they're so inundated that they don't have time to assess and you know they're doing the work yep. that like yep. you it's in the literature that multicultural affairs or culture centers are treated as the mini student affairs division so those people over there in financial aid aren't telling students you know or are treating students right and so who they go to the director of the culture center you know and so there's this one person trying to do everything so assessment sort of takes a back seat and again they can't answer questions about what's working they know they're doing important work but when it comes time to provide evidence of it you know it becomes difficult now how to get out of that i'm gonna let <laughs> i'm gonna go roger then i might follow up go next but so you know uh, in addition to being a CDO at two different institutions, I also served on the board of directors for the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education, and I helped to co-author the standards for professional practice for CDOs, which are under revision right now as well. And as part of that work, what we are trying to do is to professionalize the work of diversity officers. Um, that oftentimes, historically, what we have seen is you know, that the token person on a campus who represents a particular group gets selected to be the diversity officer. And um, that may or may not come uh, with a skill set. Uh, and that is changing rapidly in our profession. Uh, and that comes in part with having standards of professional practice that say this is the skill set that we need in order to do this work. Um, so that's really critical. And I think that um, that's true for student affairs professionals who work in the diversity space as well. 
Uh, and so, you know, that that's a critical set of uh, standards to think about and to have. And, you know, uh, one of the challenges of this work is, um, you know, and I, I've dealt with this for, you know, the 25 years I've been doing this is, and you probably are all going to start nodding your heads real quick here when I say this, everybody's an expert. This is the only field where everybody has an opinion that they believe matters as much as yours, even though you've been working in the field for 25 years and doing the research and doing the work in ways that, um, you know, maybe other people have not. And so nobody would stand up to the IT vice president and say, you know, um, why are you buying all those Dells? Don't you think, you know, or don't you think this antivirus software is better than the other one? Because I was reading on the internet a story uh, on Fox News, uh, and it said, right? But you know, I, I sit around. I sit around a conference table, and I have people respond in just almost that way about issues of diversity and inclusion on a college campus. So everybody's an expert, and that's that can be particularly challenging. And so making sure that we have the right people around the table is a really critical thing for us to make sure that we're advancing the work that we're trying to accomplish here um, and and pursuing competencies really truly pursuing competencies yes. elevating your game That's a good point. you know all right well again appreciate again as, as it relates to your I'm sorry I didn't know you wanted to speak oh, yeah. I'm just make one Please. quick comment yeah. go ahead please so I would just w say one of NASPA's big initiatives now is that the research around closing the achievement gap and I think this is, you, you talked about knowing your data. This is really going to be important for us because we have gross disparities in degree attainment that are not explainable by educational means. They're, it's all about these other factors. And so as the profession gets professionalized in all of our professions, it's practitioner work that gets tested and research that does that. So, so. I, I do see some changes on that, but external funding agencies are getting interested in this, states are getting interested in this, so that issue of closing the achievement gap I think is going to be a friend to us in this work. Mm -hmm. So, Jamie, if I could just... The other piece I would say would, uh, let me piggyback on what Roger said, develop yourself. Um, it's a skill set to sit into a conference room and to be challenged and how do I communicate, navigate, and how do I have literature is important. Um, and so putting yourself in place and space that can develop you, allowing folks within the CDO space and outside of the CDO space of the institution is very key. Secondly, I don't know how to say this without trying to be honest but not honest, I don't know what to say on this part, is if the, I've been at a couple conferences where I've heard large institutions across the nation have conversations about defunding multicultural centers. And I, the first time I heard it, I was in shock. I was like, are you serious? You know, and so my point to you is this. If the philosophy of the institution is not to support that work and you're a part of that institution, then work on yourself. I mean, I hate to say that because until the institution is ready to value what you bring to the table in other areas, um, don't, why put yourself out there? You're going to hurt yourself, stretch yourself, work yourself for institutions that are not asking you to participate. And so if they ask to defund, then if you want to work in that space and place, then maybe you have to go to another institution where you can do that. Or if you're at a place, maybe I had a colleague one time of mine said, I'm going to go get my PhD. And that's what he did. You know, he said, if they don't. And so there's a balance. Sometimes we, we are so committed. Um, but when you're committed without power, no budget, no support, no resources, no chance of conversation, then you, 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 you're, you're paddling upstream without an oar. I mean, you're not going anywhere. And so with that being said, there's, about, there's a balance of uh, you want to be in a place that at least is engaging you and supporting you. Lord, I had a brief joke. Okay, they assigned you to a position. You were once the affirmative action officer or you were a faculty member in another area and now you're the CDO. Do I have an office? Do I have a budget? Do I have an admin? I mean, the, and so, so, so the good thing is, I like to say this, if you're taking on a new position, a new institution, you should interview them just like they're interviewing you. You should sit down and be able to say, well, okay, if I'm gonna come into this role, 
Give me some history. Would have been some challenges. Would have been some opportunities. Would have been some successes. What resources will I have? So that you make an intelligent decision to a place that you want to commit to and put time and energy. Lori said it. This work is heavy. You know, she said cookie. You know, I said coffee, drink. Well, there are moments. There are moments when you're going to need outside support to navigate. And how are you going to have that at every, wherever you might be? So I just, you know. The, 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 I, I love the work, but I understand the weight of the work. And if you have the opportunity to have conversations prior to, my goodness, take advantage of those conversations before you get into a work with an institution that you're not familiar with. Right. I think I want to um, just, uh, in, in, in connection to your question, and I see another question out here, but this notion of so how do and what do we do in those spaces, and I think as a number of our panelists said, you know, certainly our, our own work is important, in addition to that is we have got to, um, as Lori was naming, uh, and again as practitioners, recognizing the dynamic of those of us who are doing the work often don't have the time to do the research, right? Or don't have the space or the emotional capacity to do the work um, and in the way that is going to be received, right? Um, and respected. Yes, we are doing the research every day. Like I've got the information for you that tells you why this matters you're not receiving it in the way that I'm delivering it, right? And so um, uh, it is important as we talk about graduate preparation programs, doctoral research uh, opportunities, those of us who are going to be more practitioner scholars, that you do look at, again, how we are um, assessing, measuring, and writing about the efficacy and the needs of these programs because um, I hear all the time when I'm going into spaces, um, well, what are the best practices? How do we know that this works? We're trying to decide whether we're going to uh, create an office or defund an office and, and all of those things. And, and so what do you know and what can you offer us around that? Uh, and, uh, you know, in the co uh, colonized institutions um, that we operate in, we have to present some of that information to move us in ways that they can receive it and understand it. So I want to take this question. Did you want to get in before we yeah, move, yeah. move? Okay, right here, please. So first I gotta say big enough environment to have an extra perspective on what the we process, so that that's a good thing. But second, I think it's reverse that I wanted to say that uh, so much of this work might be voice and you have to you look forward to that right now. You know, the same about the same thing with the city council. We have to make sure we have the full perspective. You know, Mary McCord is saying that uh you know uh Jim Lane is obviously saying the same thing. We don't want to give those credit. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, just uh, for our live streamers to recognize that these uh, folks who were, <laughs> were naming and wrote this, who had access and got, got heard in some ways, um, were not the first thinkers um, around this. And uh, as we look historically um, at often our marginalized folks, um, their, their wisdom around this um, was not, is not received and has not been received in the same ways. So another quick, quick please. Did you work in recreation? Yeah. Okay, so I mentioned that we have a, a program on our campus. It's called um, our Idea Grant Program, where people can go to our office, request funding to test out ideas for diversity and inclusion on our campus. So we got a, a budget to do those kinds of things. So our recreation department has done three things. Number one, they found individuals of color who are in actively involved in recreation, getting people out climbing, caving, uh, those areas, and brought them to our campus and had them infuse and connect to our students. And also they partnered with our multicultural center to recruit students from the multicultural center to now engage with recreation and go out and experience all the things we have around us. That was one. Number two, they created um, accessible, um, accessible uh, wheelchair basketball 
as a sport. And so now it's an intramural sport, a part of our campus. And so, so what they did is they they tapped into people nationally who are doing those types of things, brought them to our campus, created space. So now when a student has a conversation about inter wheelchair basketball, it's an open door to have conversations about other identity conversations. You've now infused the space with place using rec as the as the to bring them in. And so those are just two off the top of my head, but I think there are two others we've done trying to create those conversations. Again, this goes back to this work. Not just the multicultural centers doing all the conversations. How do you create them in different places? And so for rec, we didn't change rec. We just use who's nationally doing it, bring in men and women and folks of different backgrounds there, and then partner with our departments that has the, the um, uh, our underrepresented groups and make sure they're a part and just create some synergy around that. So it takes a little work, but that goes back to that question I think, Jamie, you had. If you're going to be a student affairs practitioner, how do you open up your department in these partnerships? The multicultural center should not be knocking on your door for all the partnerships. You should be going to them. You want their students engaged in your work, so how do you make those connections? So that's just a, some quick, simple ideas of just how do we how do we find out what's the national research about rec centers that are doing a great job of inclusivity? We, we like to look, I, I copy, borrow, uh, implement, um, and other best practices to help engage those conversations across identity groups. Uh, I, wanna add something, I, I want to add something to that, but also like think a different perspective of that we haven't discussed here. Uh, well, one, uh, I hope to see you all at Encore, at the National Conference of Race and Ethnicity <laughs> <laughs> in Portland. Uh, but the other thing, because uh, they, they just partner, did a partnership with the NCAA, uh, where they are having a, a, f a, a days and symposiums about scholarship that focus on student athletes in, uh, stu uh, of, in, uh, of color. So I really need to look at the description more of that. I know the call for proposals is out on their Twitter and so on. But the other thing that I want to think about in art is going uh, make me think your comments of work on yourself, right? And I do believe on that. But also we have to acknowledge that working on ourselves is a lot of work, but now it is expensive too because conferences continue to go up. Associations, continue, the price continues to go up, right? But we also have, we don't talk about um, how much these our student affairs practitioners are getting paid oftentimes, especially the entry level, right? So when I think about the comment that you said of like, work on yourself, well, uh, I, ha I need a job, right? I need to, and this is the first option that I, that I have, uh, and some people cannot afford that. Uh, and also the other conversation that we haven't discussed is there's also h homeless students and students that are in graduate school uh, in our programs in student affairs that are homeless, but also they, um, um, they don't have food to eat. Right? So I think that's something else that we have to be thoughtful of how when we're preparing students, they also come with these issues. We're teaching them about these issues, but sometimes they're the experts on this, unfortunately, right? Um, uh, and also when we think about negotiation, you interview people as well. Yeah, but the campuses sometimes, they lie to us, right? Because they're trying to recruit us well, until we go there and, and so on. And we cannot afford in the sense of uh, emotionally, but also economically sometimes to relocate, yes, like that, so it takes time. Yeah. We are running close to time and really do appreciate all. I'm going to invite our panelists for final thoughts in, in, in just a moment, but I do want to say again, thank you for, for, your, for your comments. And as, even as we form this panel, um, one of the important things about the student personnel point of view was whose uh, point of view um, and who's at the table and who's in the room who gets to share perspectives and, um, and what we know, and again, and one of the questions that was asked was around, again, what are the missing voices, right? And so we um, certainly were committed to creating a diverse group of scholars here, and we get to say, who did we hear from? Um, what perspectives were not present in that? Um, when we're talking about uh, the, the conversations around social justice in the context of uh, the U.S., um, what happens when race is not talked about? What happens if race is the only thing that's talked about? Who else is marginalized? Who else is not heard? Who are we talking about in the race conversation? Uh, are we having a monoracial conversation? Um, are we having a conversation that's in the black and white paradigm that's not inviting other voices and perspectives in? Um, Lori already named that we're talking about some heavy lifting. And so if we're looking at our histories and looking at our research and looking at our practices, um, it really does require 
that we invite us to own our own identities on the multiple levels that that matters and consider the student personnel point of view and the work that we have to do as student affairs practitioners from all of those lenses. Nope, we're not going to get it all figured out. No, we are not going to get it all figured out um, easily or quickly. Um, and this symposium was an opportunity for us to shed a light on what some of that might look like. So we want to invite um, final voices, final words uh, from each of our panelists, and then we'll do appreciations and wrap us up. So. We'll so again, thank way. you for the invitation. Like I said earlier during my presentation, I uh, being part of this panel provides me the opportunity to share some of those voices that are not heard in, in Spanish or in other languages, just to be thoughtful and, 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 and conscious of how we as people not only live uh, in, in a double consciousness, sometimes in a triple consciousness, uh, because a lot of our students have, the, have multiple identities that we don't speak about them, that we don't write about them, but they learn to negotiate that identity in their own way. Uh, I think about our undocumented students, they, in the third and the, the triple consciousness that they have gained is that they learn how the policy works and how it's going to affect them, oftentimes that we don't think about, right? Not only do they live in two, but they have developed a, a triple consciousness. So again, um, I think it's also important to reflect on our own privilege and oppressions, how we are, because that's, that's how I enter my job. So I hope uh, we continue to do, uh, as Vernon Wall says, do good work. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. That was excellent. Um, again, thank you for the invitation to be part of this panel. It's been uh, a really excellent experience to be on this side, and I hope it has been for those of you on that side as well. Um, I, I'm going to continue to push the envelope. I, I think I started in a, in a pretty um, aggressive, maybe, way of saying we're failing. Um, one of the ways I think we're failing is, as Penny was um, making her presentation and, and was showing the youth movements that are taking place in this country, we are about to receive some very activist students in our institutions this coming fall. And those students are going to have very high expectations, and we are ill-equipped to serve those students in the ways that they need. They are looking at a world, at a country, at a government that is failing them, that is projecting a future to them that is pretty sorry. And we have an obligation to try and help them to come to our institutions and be, at least feel safe to explore how they can have agency in the world. And one of the ways that we can do that is by making our institutions not the place that they feel like they have to have demands, that they have to have direct their activism toward their institutions of higher education because they have to fix that first before they feel like they're equipped to go out in the world and, and go into the streets just a few miles from here to make a real difference in the world. We should be equipping them to be out there making that difference. And we have a lot of work to do still. I'm reminded that whenever I get involved in something for NASPA or another professional association, I always feel like I get more than I give. And this has been one of those examples to work with these remarkable uh, scholars and practitioners. Um, I'm reminded through this experience of the power of multiple voices and multiple perspectives in um, creating lasting solutions on our campuses. So um, we do tend to talk with the people that we spend most of our time with. And so what would it be to really pull together from your own campus sort of this group to have this conversation? And what would that be like? And how would that be different? And how would that um, help shift our thinking. Um, there are faculty everywhere, and they're not all in student affairs preparation programs who have perspectives of meaning on these issues. So just um, reminding us to, to do that kind of reaching out and talking across our um, fake org chart lines. <laughs> I'm just going to encourage you. Um, 
as as we said, our nation was founded in 1607, I guess the first group came. 1619, uh, the first enslaved, I guess, person came. Um, 1693, began the work with Bacon's Rebellion, where after that rebellion, the racial and gender codes were created. So there's a lot of work still to be done. <laughs> you dismantle, there's a lot of work to be done. And so I just encourage you, as you mentioned, uh, young sir, take care of yourself, uh, take care of those around you, uh, where you can have influence, have influence, lead where you can, encourage um, folks. And I just leave you with a quote from Nelson Mandela. The greatest glory in living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. And so I just encourage you. Um, um, no, I, I tell my kids, all, life's not easy. Just get, keep getting up. <laughs> um, you have to get up, and, and I know it doesn't feel good, doesn't always feel good, but you know what? Um, I'm here and I'm not going anywhere. Deal with me, here we go. And I just encourage you, keep doing the work and keep, 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 keep taking care of yourself throughout the process. Uh, just to reiterate what um, everyone else has said, it's been a pleasure to be a part of this panel. Uh, and as I'm, you know, sitting here thinking, you know, what will the student personnel point of view be in the next 70 years? Um, and my hope is that as a field, when we talk about students' holistic development, we really mean it. So we mean their racial identity and their gender identity, <laughs> all of these pieces that uh, tend to be taken for granted. Um, and the other piece, um, uh, which I think links directly to uh, the piece I talked about, the elements of a student uh, personnel program, um, deal with um, what the future holds for how we actually deal with students who do things that don't reflect the point of view that we offer. And I think what's been resonating with me over the past week and probably, or the past several days, was the situation on the mall with the Covington High School student. I want a person who works in, because that person's gonna go to college, right? And they will probably join a fraternity and continue to do you know things like that. But that student affairs people are there to check it immediately. Uh, and I am hoping that there is some way where we don't just dismiss students and think it's okay. They're no longer a part of this institution and think it's fine because they're gonna go to another school and do it. But like we actually have things in place to educate that person. Um, I don't know, I, I'm hopeful for a better world. We won't be around in 70 years, but I'm hoping future generations will be able to look at this, this uh, symposium and also be able to reflect and maybe even pull out some of the gaps we've missed today. Uh, I'm thinking of Peter Magolda, I think because Lori mentioned him and who was you know, heavily involved in ACPA and um, was a mentor to me and so many others. And I'm just thinking about how Peter really had a gift for making people feel seen. And, and the fact that he was a white man, he was just this rare white man, I think, who made me feel so valued and so heard. And it makes me think about, you know, in student affairs, a lot of times we talk about relationships, right? It's all about people. It's all about nice people and people. I think we sometimes forget is that relationships have structural implications. Um, and just thinking of how, you know, the effect that P Peter was able to have on so many of us in the profession, right? And those of us who are, um, who are faculty and many who I know are in senior level positions all over the country. Um, and yeah, how that had such a big impact. And so I think I'm, you know, um, yeah, just thinking about it's, it's not just one person, but it is many of us, right, working together, making the students that, um, yeah, that we work with feel seen, feel heard, feel known, um, and that higher education can be a better place because of that. Thank you. So as we wrap up, I want to say that I um, just want to make a couple of quick announcements. But before I go there, I really want to say that as we attempt to make the space better, we will mess up. We will do the, uh, we'll come together, uh, we'll have our best intentions and thoughts and so on as a, 
as a, as a body of good people and nice people, and we will make mistakes. So we are in this space, and for the last 45 minutes or so, we've had the poster of this symposium without Julie on it. <laughs> and the practice, often of our minoritized folks, is to say it's okay. Um, and we're very forgiving. Um, and what I know is that that was not our intention. Um, but we must be willing in this work to own the impact. And so um, while um, it might be okay for Julie, the impact is bigger than just what might happen for Julie. So I want to um, publicly acknowledge that um, as we are here um, and as we begin to wind down this experience, um, I just want to invite you to continue to be with us, all of us, on the journey um, to making the place better, to living up to our core values. Uh, we invite you to join us for our conventions that are coming up, um, particularly as we celebrate the 95th convention in Baltimore, I'm sorry, in Boston, <laughs> trying, to, trying to go home, uh, 90, <laughs> 95th convention, Chris, I'm sorry, 95th convention in Boston. Uh, we will be there in a great celebration um, of the work that has been done with opportunities to continue deepening our conversations. We've got um, some good work that's going to be happening with a panel on generations um, and engaging across the, uh, uh, this conversation and doing this work across generations with folks who've been in it for 40 years and folks who are just starting it as well and what that looks like and the difference. We're also excited about, um, uh, we have uh, established this coming up next uh, uh, summer, uh, President, uh, Vice President, a Senior uh, Student Affairs Officer um, Symposium uh, uh, and Institute through a Racial Justice Lens. Um, and so we've got lots of great things. Please stay tuned for all of those things that are coming up. And thank you so much for joining us today.